sense the two major realms of economic policy that affect a macro economy. We're talking about fiscal policy, which we'll define and talk about how it's conducted and how it impacts the economy, and monetary policy, who designs and conducts monetary policy, broad overview of how and how it impacts the economy. If you're going to take a course in macroeconomics, this is a large part of what you're going to study. If you're taking a finance course or want to become familiar with the world of finance, I think an understanding of macroeconomics in these terms is very useful. All right? Now, in order to do this, we're going to use a particular uh, method of explanation, a kind of a supply and demand diagram. We're going to describe the economy in terms of Q, how much output we're creating, what we call gross domestic product. And then up on the price axis, we will put P standing really for the price level or rate of inflation. Now, there are different models to who have opinions on how the economy operates, and sometimes they draw the curves a little differently. But for our purposes, we're going to draw an aggregate supply curve, like a supply curve in microeconomics, except it's the, the supply curve for the entire GDP of a country. And we're going to draw it with this particular shape. We're going to start it out as a flat line, and as we're moving out this way, we're producing more GDP. The economy is getting bigger, producing more, more people working, more incomes being earned, more money being spent. And then at some point out here is going to be a maximum level. It's the, the maximum of what the economy can produce. I'm going to call it quantity FE for full employment output. That's the absolute maximum GDP the economy can produce. Now, what that means is everybody's working, right? Except we know that even when the economy is just booming, we know there will always be a few people not working, a, a certain amount of unemployment, which, which we call the natural rate of unemployment, that it is a natural occurrence in, in an economy that you will have people, at least in two categories, who don't have jobs, maybe looking, or still are looking, but don't have jobs. These are people between jobs, maybe you finished a, a college program and you're looking for a job, or you lost your job and you're temporarily unemployed looking for another job. We call those transitional or frictionally unemployed people. And there are what we call structurally unemployed people, folks who, for example, their job skills have become outdated and obsolete, and so they're they're not really employable because their skills are out of date. Uh, folks who suffer from discrimination in the marketplace can't find a job. That still occurs too, unfortunately. So at this level of full employment, we want to note that the unemployment rate is going to be, oh, approximately 5%. Some folks think it's higher these days, but we'll use 5% for now. So that's the best we can ever do. At that level of output, we have to draw the supply curve, and I'm going to draw it up here, as a vertical line, aggregate supply, because we can't produce more than that. This is the maximum production. Now, at some point, this flat part of the curve begins to curve up. It doesn't go all the way out and then turn north. It's got a gradual increase in the slope coming along, let's say, like that. Okay. So we've got really three parts to this curve, the supply curve. There's the flat portion in here, uh, for reference, called the Keynesian range. There's the vertical portion out here, called the classical range. And then that's, there's that curved area in between that we call the, uh, the modified aggregate supply curve, okay? the intermediate range. We'll look at what that implies for our analysis in just a minute. But once we've drawn this aggregate supply curve, we look now at the way we're going to focus most of our discussion on the macroeconomy, 
we're going to say, well, let's, let's put an aggregate demand curve out there. Let's put one right here for right now. Aggregate demand curve number one. Now, aggregate demand is a measure of the total spending that's going on in the economy. In some classes you may have seen before, that's the consumption spending by households, buying you know, household items, groceries, etc. Plus it's the investment spending by businesses when they produce more inventory or create more capital goods or construction. It's the spending by governments at all levels, local, national, state. And it's the net spending by our foreign trading partners, the net exports that they buy, which for the United States has been a negative number since the 1970s. Okay? But these are the spending flows. All of this spending together sums up into aggregate demand. So if we take this out of the way, so we have a little room to operate, and we say that Wherever the aggregate demand and the aggregate supply curve are intersecting is our current equilibrium. So we have an equilibrium here at point A, which tells us that over here, let's say the rate of inflation is 1%, and down here the level of GDP is less than full employment. Don't know the number, we don't need a number yet, but what do we know? If we're not producing as much as we could, then we have a lot of people who are unemployed. So, in this case, we're going to say the unemployment rate, just kind of making up a number, is 9%. If this were the circumstance in the economy, relatively low inflation, but also relatively high unemployment, the question becomes, economists, explain this to me and tell me what we need to do about it. Two alternative approaches, okay? Approach number one is to use Fiscal policy. Just a quick note. Fiscal policy. This would be the use by the government of either government spending or some change in taxes or taxation by the government on the economy. Now think about what's going to happen. If they increase government spending, that's going to increase aggregate demand. There will be more spending going on. And in fact, when the government comes in and spends money, it hires people to build a road, for example. Remember, those people turn around and take their income and they spend it again in a store, wherever. And whoever receives that money spends it again. Ever decrease in amounts, but the money gets respent, 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 and you get an increase in total spending in the economy. That's one route, increase government spending move you out closer to full employment, create more spending, more jobs. An alternative is, what if we reduce taxes? We could reduce people's taxes, they'd have more money, arguably, they're going to go out and spend that extra money, and the process repeats itself. So, broadly speaking, fiscal policy is the government's use of spending and taxes with the idea of moving aggregate demand, moving total spending, and improving, in this case, the unemployment situation. Great theory. A little quick note. In the United States these days, okay, what's going on? Who conducts fiscal policy? Who, who decides whether to spend more or less, whether to raise taxes, lower taxes? And the answer is the United States Congress. And the United States Congress has 435 members in the House of Representatives and 100 senators, and we have a president with veto power. So essentially you've got 536 people trying to come up with some policy they can all more or less, most of them, agree, agree on to try to affect the economy. And we know in the United States these days that our Congress is in gridlock. Uh, they, they, can't, they, they won't even talk to each other. The opposing parties are so dramatically spread apart, so opposed to one another, mostly by the way I think for political reasons, but the prospect of using fiscal policy in the American economy today to do anything is pretty well nil. Not to mention, by the way, there is a school of economics that says fiscal policy wouldn't have much effect anyway. But fiscal policy, traditionally for the last 50, 60 years in the American economy, has been something we relied on and it seemed to have worked pretty well. All right, the other alternative on how do we get out of this mess Instead of defending, depending on 
536 people to make a decision. We have another alternative. It's called monetary policy. Let's just put a note over here. Monetary policy is conducted by the Federal Reserve System, what we'll call the Fed. Now, the, the Fed is, is run by a board of governors, which consists of how many? Seven people. You've got seven people over here. And they're not elected the way these folks are over in the, the House and the Senate. They're not elected. They're appointed by the President. They're confirmed by the Senate. They serve 14-year terms to which they cannot be reappointed. So they're pretty well removed and insulated from the political process in the way of having to stand for election and, and be popular. And so the board can take undertake some fairly unpopular actions if it thinks it needs to. Incidentally, one of those person's terms expires every two years to be reappointed or to be appointed a new person by the president. What that effectively does is says that the president can't simply come in here and fire everybody and put his buddies in place. He has a limited influence on the behavior of the Federal Reserve Board. Now, parenthetically, just to, to put it up here, the Federal Open Market Committee consists of five other Federal Reserve Bank presidents around the country, and along with the seven members of the board, and they are even more active in particularly the day-to-day -day operations of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve and monetary policy basically is the Fed making changes to the money supply or the growth rate of the money supply. And the money supply for our economy is, is kind of like the, the lubricants in an engine. They make it work. Okay, they make it work smooth. And if you increase or decrease the money supply, you have a direct effect on the economy, in the short run particularly, because you then change interest rates, little i is interest rates. And once you've changed interest rates, if you reduce them, for example, households have incentive to go out and borrow more money, run their credit cards up. Businesses have an incentive to borrow more money and expand their inventories or build new, new buildings. Okay? So a, let's do it this way. An increase in the money supply tends to decrease interest rates, which tends to stimulate more spending and increase aggregate demand. Change in the money supply, increase causes a change in interest rates decrease, which increases aggregate demand. In this case, you would be trying, and as we're showing on the graph, trying to move the aggregate demand curve further out and create more jobs. And the alternative, if the aggregate demand curve were too far out here, let's do that just for a second. If the aggregate demand curve were way out here, what's happened? Well, you're at full employment. That's nice. Everybody who wants a job has one. But the rate of inflation has gone up. And inflation can destroy an economy just as easily as huge recessions and unemployment. In this case, with a very high level of aggregate demand, AD2, we might want to undertake the opposite policy here. We might want to reduce the money supply, which would cause interest rates to rise. As interest rates go up, people say, whoa, I can't afford to borrow as much, so spending decreases. Okay. So you could have a stimulatory or a contractionary monetary policy, same way over here. If you had too high a rate of inflation in this simplistic model, you could reduce government spending or raise taxes, and in either case you would begin to drag down or reduce aggregate demand, shifting it to the left, bringing down the rate of inflation. But if you bring it down too low and you shift it back over here, you start raising unemployment. So there seems to be a trade-off here. If you bring inflation down too far, you get unemployment. If you try to cure unemployment too strongly, you get inflation. And of course, what we would be trying to do is to keep the demand curve somewhere in this range where we get as much unemployment eliminated as possible without causing too high a rate of inflation. It's kind of a balancing game, if it were even that precise. But that's it. Monetary and fiscal policy attempts to manipulate, manage the level of aggregate demand, which then has an influence either on low rates of unemployment, if that's your problem, or on high rates of inflation, if that's your problem. Okay? Very broad overview. Nothing about the mechanics, but 
look at a couple of the limitations. We have a, a gridlock Congress, which makes fiscal policy not very workable. We have a Fed with a relatively small group of people who can take action fairly quickly. Let me just conclude that within today's economy in the United States, and this is the year 2012, the Fed has increased the money supply and driven interest rates very, very low, but still nothing is happening. Because even with low interest rates, you can't force people to borrow and spend money. You can't force businesses to borrow and spend money. And so we're, we're sitting in this area C of uncertainty, wondering what's going to happen, if anything, next. And then if you really want to complicate it, don't forget we have a presidential election in a few months, and nobody wants to do anything to upset the boat too much. And so you and I and the American consumer, the American worker, the American household, are stuck with wait and see. Thanks.